Bibles to Ephesians 4. If you need a Bible, then we will provide one for you, but uh, Ephesians 4, and they're out in the lobby if you need one. And Ephesians is almost at the very back of your Bibles. Uh, feel free to look at the index up front to find out where it's at. Um, Ephesians 4, and, and this week we're going to be reading from 11 through verse 16. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Uh, last week we talked about connecting to the source that source being Jesus Christ. Um, and this week we're going to talk a little bit about um, growth, how to grow. Uh, we're doing a three-week series about the source uh, movement. And we first believe you need to connect to the for source. And that's what we talked about last week. And this week we're going to talk about how do you end up actually growing. Let's read Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's uh, open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today and we read your word. And Father, I know we're just glancing in it real quick for the very first time, this Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 passage. But you tell us that whenever we open up your word and we receive it, then you will grow us in our relationship with you. You will grow our faith. You will grow us through your Holy Spirit. So Father, we just ask that you give us the eyes to see what you're teaching here this morning. You give us the ears to hear how we can apply it to our lives. And you give us the faith to actually step out in courage to live differently for you. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. What Paul is talking about here to the church of Ephesus, what he writes and begins with is he begins with that there are certain functions within the church. This is a brand new church in Ephesus. And Paul, who planted it, is actually writing a letter to, back to them to encourage them because he's in jail at this point. And so he tells the people, starting out with, he says, Listen, there are some who are going to have different functions within the church. So Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. Like I said, last week we talked about connecting to the source because you've got to have a relationship with God first. God wants you to connect with him. He is the source. But this week, once you've connected with the source, you're like a brand new child. Somebody who's been born for the very first time. You're, you're an infant in the faith. And what Paul is writing to his church is, how do you grow in your relationship with God? How do you measure your relationship in a sense with God? It's like a child who... Is, is just born. We got one who's three and a half months old here. And over time, as this baby grows to a year old or to two years, some people, what they do is they take a mark and they mark it on the wall, the child's height. And at five years, you mark it again. And, and at 10 years, you mark it again. And, and 15, you mark it. And then somewhere along the way, we, we begin to plateau. And then later, even in life, we shrink back. We actually grow, we plateau, and then we can even shrink back when we get older. And it's very similar with the Christian faith. When you start out, you're an infant. And what Paul's writing to the church is, because it's a very new church, it's a brand new church, and it's a lot of people at this point, but they're all growing, and they're like, how do we grow in our faith? And so Paul writes to them right off the bat. He says, hey, there's going to be certain functions within the church. Some are going to be pastors. Some are going to be teachers. Some are going to be evangelists. And it almost, in a sense... It's like a parent. It's like a parent who's measuring their child. I got 
five M's for you this morning for you to remember. So open up your bulletins and hopefully you grabbed a pen when you came in this morning. Open it up to the note section and write the very first one and put measuring. Measuring. And it's like a, a parent who's measuring up their child. Watching them as they observe over time their growth and just reflecting in it. But in order to measure our growth, Paul writes certain things. He says there are certain people in place that help you. They're like parents. And these parents are measuring you over time. And they're teaching you and they're equipping you. And I think of why God gave us parental roles. I think of my own children. Okay, my own children sometimes test me to the limits. They'll come to me crying. They'll come to me whining. Sometimes my children won't do what I say for them to do. They won't listen for the very first time. Sometimes they'll completely ignore me and walk away from me. And then you need to discipline them. And parenting can be a very frustrating role at times. For the new parents in the room, okay, you got something ahead of you to look forward to. Sometimes it can be very frustrating. It can also be very rewarding, but sometimes it can be very frustrating. And I think it's because God gives us parents because often God is a parent to us and he's showing us that relationship role of between God and his people is the same as between parent and child. And so in the Old Testament, they never even used God's name. They never spoke God's name. They never wrote God's name. In fact, they would often leave it blank. When they were writing this Bible, they would leave the, the words blank because they couldn't even write God's name. It was so holy they didn't even want to write it. And they thought, well, if we write it, we'll get in trouble. God, God will look down on us. God is such a holy God that we can't even write out his name. And Jesus came, he taught a completely different concept. What Jesus comes is, and he says, Abba, in his prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, Abba, which means Father. And it's a very intimate relationship that Jesus is showing that he can have with his God. He also says, God, I pray that as me and you are one, us people can be one as also. And they can have the same relationship with you that I have with you. And so Jesus comes and he flips everything upside down. The people wouldn't even mention God's name. And Jesus comes and he calls him Father. He says, you are my Father in heaven. We have this so close of a relationship that you are a parent to me. And I'm learning from you and you're teaching me. And so when Paul writes in the church of Ephesus, he's saying the same thing. There are some parental roles within the church. We're going to have some pastors. We're going to have some teachers. We're going to have some evangelists. We're going to have some leadership positions in the church. And they are parents to the new Christians in faith. And so the second M I want you to write down is mentoring. Is mentoring. We have some mentors in the church. And these mentors have specific roles. There's going to be people that ignore them at certain times. There's going to be people that test them. There's going to be some that whine and complain at certain times because the church is sinful in nature and we're like little children and we're like growing and, and we measure over time and, and we see our growth. And so something we might have done very early on in our Christian faith, we stop and, and, and we stop doing it and now we do something different later on because we're talking about growing in this whole process of maturity. So we have this mentor role. In order for what? Why do we need pastors? Why do we need leaders? Why do we need teachers? Why do we need to be mentored? And what Paul says in Ephesians 4.12 says, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. First he lifts out some positions within the church that these are the parental roles. And these parental roles serve as what? To equip the people, to equip and what Paul is essentially saying is the children, the new ones of the faith. We're going to teach them. We're going to equip them. We're going to allow them to practice. They're going to grow up. It's like a new child riding a bike for the very first time. They're going to fall along the way, but eventually they're going to begin to pedal, and they're going to get the handle of the balance, and they're going to be able to ride that bike. But at first they're going to fall, and we need people to be able to catch them as they fall, and we need people to be able to be alongside them as they fall and to pick them back up and to place them back on the bike and to allow them to ride again. See, so many people in the church, they practice, they look down on others. They fall and we get mad and we look down on them and we're like, oh, they're never going to get it. They're never going to ride their bike. They're never going to succeed. And Paul says something very different to these people. 
He says, you guys are in place in order to equip these people. That's what God does with his people. He equips them. He doesn't look down on them. So a child that's trying to walk for the very first time, he's taken his very first few steps, and the child falls. And, and God doesn't say, oh, what a horrible child. You're never going to learn to walk. You're never going to get it. You're horrible. He doesn't look at his people like that. He doesn't look at his children like that. What does a loving parent do? You pick that child up and you celebrate. You say, yes, you took that first step. Yes, you rode a couple hundred meters before you fell. Let's try it again. That's what God does with his people. And that's what he's teaching. Paul is teaching the church to do. He's saying, your job is to equip the saints. The saints are the ones who have been set apart. The saints are the ones who are God's people. They've been set apart for God to do his work. It's the church. And he's saying as leaders, as loving parents, you are to walk beside them in order to equip them. You are to mentor them. But notice, he doesn't say, hey, you as the leaders, you're to do all the work. Hey, you as the leaders, you are to get everything done and the people are just to show up. No, he says you are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so parenting, if you think about it, you have a child for 18 years. The child becomes an adult in our culture, usually at 18. And what do you do? They move out. Sometimes it's at 20. Sometimes it's at 22. I always tease my kids and say it's going to be 18 years and then you're out the door. I would never do that, but I always tease them, get them, they're mentally ready. But our job as parents is to discipline them, to teach them, so one day they can be successful adults and move out the door. They can do the work. They can live the life. You're not going to parent your kids for their entire life the same way you would parent a 2-year-old, a 20-year-old, or the same way you would parent a 2-year-old to a 40-year-old, or a 2-year-old to a 60-year-old. No. Eventually, you're going to be able to let go slowly. And when you try to control too much, bad things happen. The kids often rebel. It's the same way within the church where the, the leaders are there to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. If the leaders are doing all of the work, then the body of Christ can't be built up. The people are sitting there just attending. It's like a well-known coach who was once asked, how much does a college football team contribute to the national physical fitness picture? How much does, does national football actually contribute to being in shape? And the coach replied, nothing. Well, why not, said the interviewer. Well, said the coach, the way I see it, you have 22 men down on the field desperately needing a rest. And you have 40,000 people in the stands desperately needing some exercise. Sometimes it's the same way in the church. You see, we call this the 80-20 rule, which means 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And that's not just in our church, that's in the majority of churches. I've actually been impressed that the majority of the people who come to our church are actually involved because we only have a few amount of people so far. And so if you come to the Source Church, what happens is we give you a job. You get involved. You set up. You clean up. You, you, you get involved right away. It's, it's awesome. But in the majority of churches, you have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. And that's a leadership issue. The people aren't getting involved. You got people sitting in the stands. They come and sit in the pews. And the leaders are the one doing the work. But Paul says something to the church. He says, you need to delegate the work to the people. You need to get them involved. They need to be a part of the church. It is the body of Christ so it can be built up. Because if they're not a part of something, then they're not involved. They're not part of the body. They're just sitting there. And they're becoming fat in the stands. They're becoming spiritually fat believers. And so, so he says, get in the game. And what he's talking about, number three, I want you to write down, is membership membership. You see, there's, there's really three things that, that Paul says we need to do in order to, to uh, measure, to, in order to grow. He says that we need to be in unity, we need to have knowledge, and we need to have maturity. We need to have unity, we have to have knowledge, and we have to have maturity. If you look at it in Ephesians, this is what it says in verse 
13, until all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so that's what Paul is telling us. In order to be able to become mature Christians, in order to be able to measure up, what we need to do is we need to have unity, we need to have knowledge, and we need to be mature. And in order to have unity, membership, we, we need to actually come together. Paul talks about it as a body. He says, listen, we're all part of this body. We all have different parts. We can all do different things. But we can't all teach, and we can't all preach, and we can't all do one thing. Everybody has a different role within the church. It's like going to a, a race track. Who likes NASCAR in here? Does anybody watch NASCAR? One, two, okay. You go to NASCAR and you got the drivers, right? Everybody wants to sit behind the wheel and they want to drive. That's the cool thing. Everybody watches the drivers go around the track very fast. But the truth is, a driver cannot drive if other people don't get involved. Because a driver needs his pit crew to get involved in order to be able to drive that car. When a driver pulls in, the pit crew immediately reacts. You have people that, that change all four of the tires. You have people that fill the gas tank. You have people that wash the windshield. You have people that give the driver a drink. You have people that make a vital adjustments to the car. And if everybody wants to drive, then you're not going to win because you need all of these different functions in order to be able to function together as, un as one in unity and membership. And it's the same way within the church. In order for a church to be built up, in order for people to come together, Everybody needs to get involved and they have different functions within. And so there might be somebody who can preach. Well, great. You know what? We'll equip you and we'll train you and we'll allow you to sit in this chair and it won't always be me. There might be some people that can teach. And so great. We will allow you to go into a group and gather people around you and teach them in a weekly Bible study. There might be some people who say, my gift is service. Well, at our service events or our service projects, that's for you. For this walk, everybody can do it. We all show up and we can all walk. For setup, it doesn't take a wonderful gift to be able to carry a table. Everybody can get involved. But you see, if, if everybody wanted to teach and everybody wanted to preach, then the truth is then nothing would get set up. We wouldn't have music in the mornings. We wouldn't have singing. We wouldn't have these nice refreshments out there. There's different people that work behind the scenes in order for a church to be able to function. And that's what Paul is saying is everybody has a different gift given from God. And use that gift in your best capacity in order for the entire church to be built up. It's about membership. Some people don't want to get involved. And they like just to sit back and just show up. And what Paul is saying is, hey, we have too many people sitting back. As a church, in order to really be a church, everybody needs to get involved in something. Everybody can contribute somewhere. And that's what I love about our church is that so many people do contribute. He says it's the body of Christ. We've all been equipped with different skills and certain tasks. And that's what Paul uses at the very end. He uses the analogy of a body. He says it's, we all have different features. It's like having hands and legs and arms and fingers and toes, we all can't be a hand. We all can't be a foot. We all have different parts. And what happens is we all come together as one body in Jesus Christ. And that's what he calls actually the church. But who are we growing up to attempt to become? So we're growing up in life in this infancy. We have a body. We have, we're serving. But who are we growing up to become? And what Paul says is he says, we shall become, in verse 13, we shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full nature. In the NIV, it says it like this. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. 
So who's our direction? Who are we trying to become? We're trying to become more like Jesus Christ. He's our example. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the one that we're trying to actually become like. And so number four, the fourth M I have for you, is mimic. We are to actually mimic Jesus Christ. And that takes time. You see, we become saved and we're immediately justified before God. Last week I preached about becoming connected to the source. And if you missed that, you can always face, uh, Facebook it. And it'll show up right on our Facebook page and you can watch it. And we connect to the for source and we're justified and we're saved. And we have immediate relationship with God. But then how do we grow we're to be sanctified? That's a, that's a big word that just talks about becoming more like Jesus Christ. Mimicking Jesus Christ. Becoming more like him. He's our direction. He's our goal. He's who we're heading to. But we want kind of that immediate reaction. We want that immediate growth. We want to go from five years old to 20 years old. I have a nine-year-old who's going on 16 already. And why do we say that? It's because younger children want to become older children way too quick. They act like they want to be older. They, they pretend like they're older. They have a little bit of attitude like they're older, right? New Christians can be like that too. We want immediate results right now. We want to be like Jesus Christ. We've arrived and we want to pretend and then when we fall, we become discouraged with ourselves and we beat ourselves up. But what I wanted to talk to you this morning about is that growth is a slow process. Discipleship is a slow process. Mimicking Jesus over time takes time. Discipleship is the process of conforming to be like Christ. Your journey will last your entire life to become more like him. Every day, God wants you to become a little more like him. You have to begin to live a new life in which you're being made new and becoming like the one who made you, Paul writes in Colossians 3.10. 3, 10. You have begun to live a new life in which you're being made new on a daily experience, Paul talks about. Today, we're obsessed with speed. But God is more interest, interested in, in strength and stability. He wants you to be stable and not always so swift. He's not interested in swiftness. He's interested in stability. But we as people, we often want a quick fix, right? We want it here and now and Burger King and McDonald's and all these fast foods teach us like this. We want a quick fix. But there's no shortcut to spiritual growth. There's no sermon or seminar or an experience that will instantly revolve or solve all of your problems. There's not. It's one day at a time. It's one step at a time. And I would even tell you it's one decision at a time to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And every decision that we make grows us farther in the faith as we journey toward God. And so he tells us to mimic but real maturity is never the result of a single experience. No matter how powerful or moving, growth is always gradual. And that's why I use the illustration of a child. Think about it. Every single month in the first two years, that child grows. But then they begin to plateau. In fact, in the first two weeks, a child is supposed to actually double their weight and double their growth. But after two years, they both plateau for a little bit. And then they hit a growth spurt. And then they plateau again. And then they hit a growth spurt. And then they plateau again. And then they hit a growth spurt. And then they plateau again. And it's the same way as the Christian faith. We grow immediately when we become new believers. We want to read this book. And we get excited about this book. And we get excited about what it says. And we hear the stories. And then sometimes the stories become a little old and we stop. And sometimes we'll stop going to Bible studies. And sometimes we'll stop going to church and we plateau until one day God wakes us up and he shakes us and we begin to grow again and we go through another growth spurt. It takes time. That's real maturity. People often build their identity around their defects. We say, it's, it's just like me to be and it's just like the way I am when we fall. We get discouraged 
And we say, no, we're never going to change. When we hit those plateau moments, we just feel like there's no hope. I was talking to somebody yesterday through text. And he says, everyone's abandoned me. And I feel like nothing ever is going to change in my life. And I told him, I said, you need to come to church. And you need to hear what it's like to grow. Because God changed my life and I'm sure he can change yours as well. But you need to actually connect to God. You need to actually spend some time with God in order for him to work in your life. Think about it. Habits take time to develop. That's why they come out with all these new things. You got uh, workout videos and it comes out with 21 days of working out because they say after 21 days, if we can get you to work out for 21 days, it actually becomes a habit in your life. If we can get you consistent for 21 days, then we know that you will continue to do it. And so habits take time to develop. Remember that your character is the sum total of your habits. You can't claim to be kind unless you're habitually kind. Meaning that you show kindness without even thinking about it. You can't claim to have integrity unless you continually show up on time and are honest and have integrity. You can't claim that you're faithful to your spouse only 90% of the time because that 10% means that you're unfaithful. Your habits define your character and habits take time to actually create. And there's only one way to develop the habits of a Christ-like character. You must practice them. It takes time. It's one decision. It's one step at a time. There's no instant habits. Paul urged Timothy, he said, practice these things. Devote your life to them so that everyone can see your progress. It takes time. It's like the story of an accomplished artist who was applying the finishing touches to a bronze sculpture. He kept filling in, he kept scraping and polishing every little surface of his masterpiece. When will it be done? Asked an observer. Never came his reply. I just keep working and working until they come and take it away. Much the same could be same for the children of God. We are saved by grace and declared righteous because we believe and have faith in Jesus Christ of what he has done. But until we die, we will be continually working and working and working to mimic Jesus Christ. But until then, I should say, we're mimicking him. God is continuing to work on us until we die. Until he takes us away, he is the master. We are his masterpiece and he's continually scraping at us. He's continually filling us in. He's continually creating a new design around us and filling in the pieces within us. He's working on us until he finally takes us away. Someone observed to the artist, the acorn does not become an oak in a day. It is not one touch of the artist's brush that produces a finished painting. There are always months between seed time and harvest. Whether you're a new believer or have setbacks and failures discourage you, we are to stay in touch with God and allow him to continue painting us with every stroke of the pen. And then the last one, what Paul talks about, is in mimicking Jesus Christ. He says that there's something that can happen. There's, there's something that can happen to us. If you got that Ephesians passage open, look at verse 14, what it says. It says, Then you will no longer be infants. So Paul is actually talking about a finished product tossed back and forth by the waters and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Notice what he says here. If you've got your pen, you should underline this in your Bible. You'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. You should underline infants, teaching, and the cunning of craftiness. Because what Paul is saying is there's three things that can really distract you. There's three things that blow you back and forth. And so you're like a wave just being blown back and forth by the wind. The wind is controlling you. You're not controlling yourself. The culture is controlling you. Everything else is controlling you. And what he says is there's three things. He says, number one, doctrine. Notice what it says here. It says, we are no longer infants tossed and back back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. He's talking about doctrine. He's talking about knowledge. What do people believe? You see, in the church in about the 1500s, 
what had taken place was the people didn't know their Bible. They didn't understand the Bible. In fact, they couldn't even read the Bible because the Bible was written in Latin. People didn't know Latin. The Bible wasn't printed. There wasn't a bunch of these. And so you would actually have to go to school and be a seminarian. And then you become a priest. And then you could actually go out and you could teach the people. And what had happened was the priests had begun teaching the people that you could actually pay your way into heaven. All you have to do is throw so much money into the church and all of your sins would be forgiven. Until there was a reformer that came along and said, absolutely not. When I read this in the book of Romans, it actually says that you're saved by grace, that it's Jesus that paid the price into heaven and that you can't pay your way into heaven. The priests were teaching that because they needed more money in order to fund the, uh, their basilicas like St. Peter and all these wonderful masterpieces that they made over, that if you go over to Rome today, you can see and you can walk through. They've, bec they've become museums because the people don't go and worship there anymore. But the Catholic Church was growing. People were paying their way in. And that's what they actually thought. And so when he's writing this, he's like, hey, there's going to be false teachings along the way. There's going to be false doctrines along the way. Because people don't know their Bible. They don't know what the Word says. And so they're going to believe whatever they're taught. When Paul would travel from place to place, he would actually congratulate those who looked up what he was teaching and say, oh, you're right in your teachings. He says, don't take what I'm telling you at face value. And I would tell you the same thing. Don't take what I'm ta talking about face value. Go to the Bible and look at the verses yourself and make sure that what I'm teaching is true. Because there's some who say, you know what? It's not about Jesus. It's about you. There's some that would say it's not about God or what you're doing for God. It's about how you're feeling today. In fact, God just wants to bless you and he wants to produce more wealth in you and he wants to produce more money for you. And so we have this health, wealth, gospel teaching doctrine out there today. And people are accepting it. They're embracing it. They're going to church and they're getting frustrated with God when nothing happens. And what Paul is saying is, listen, these things are going to toss you back and forth like the waves. If you follow these things, follow the knowledge of what he writes in his Bible. Don't follow other teachings. And don't follow schemes. Don't follow people. Don't follow human cunning. These can distract you. But this is what you're to follow. And he goes into, right after verse 14, go to 15. It says, instead, speaking of truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined together and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. I love that. I love that. Why? Because we as a church, we've based our mission off of that. Last week, we talked about, about connecting to the source because we believe that God is the one that empowers us. We as a church, it's our job to equip. So we empower people. And then people go out and make an impact for God. That's what our church is all about. Empowering people in knowledge and truth so they can grow into maturity and become mature believers and mature Christians and so that they can do their job well and build the church up in order to do their part. And so the fifth M I want you to write down is ministry. It's ministry. Because what he talks about in verse 15, he says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is in Christ. That is our part. That is what we do. We speak the truth in love. What is the truth? The Bible. The Bible is the truth. It's God's word. You see, because there's a big difference. If we think that the, 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 everything is about us and that we use terms like Jesus lives in us, instead of us living in Christ, here's the difference I want you to see in here. It becomes that everything becomes about us if Jesus just lives us, in us. It's true that Jesus does live in us. But if we just believe that Jesus lives in us, then think about that. It's about us. It's about our will, our way, and how we do it. But if we say we actually live in Christ and we're to be built up for Christ, then it's what he does in mimicking. There's, there's four things. Do we have those on the screen? Can you go to the fourth one? 
there's four things that we normally embrace. And it says, put yourself in one of these four categories. I'm going to do what I want, regardless of any thought for God. This is how the world lives. Number two, if God gives me what I want, then I will give him what he wants. This is how some believers live. Number three, if I give God what he wants with faith, that he will give me what I want. So we say, all we have to do is have a little more faith. All we do is have to pray a little more. All we do is have to believe a little more, and we'll get whatever we want. Here is number four, the step of a mature believer. It says, I will give God what he wants regardless of any thought for myself. Most believers fall between category two and three. And what we want to do is we want to progress people from number one. They're living for themselves. It's all about them. Number two, if God gives me what I want, then I will give him what he wants. If God would just bless me today, then I'll serve him. If God would just answer this prayer, then I'll go to church. Or number three is, all I got to do is have a little more faith and then God will heal me. Number four is the, the mark of a true, honest, mature b believer. I give my life to God no matter what. God has bought me. God has purchased me with a price through Jesus Christ and shed his blood for me. That is a true, mature believer. You look at Jesus and mimicking him. How do we know that God truly loves us? What did Jesus do? Jesus went to the cross and died for the people who were persecuting him and he was, died for the people who were actually hating him. He died for those who were throwing stones at him, who were spitting on him, who placed a crown on his head of thorns and beat him senseless. They put nails through his hands and through his feet and put him on a cross to actually starve to death. A horrible way to actually die. And he did that for the very people who hated him. Jesus said any time being God could have called down angels from heaven, the Bible says. He could have called them down to represent him, to defend him, to kill all of these people, but instead he sacrificed himself. He humbled himself to the cross in order to die and go to hell for the people who actually put him on that cross so that they could be saved. That is an example of love. And so number four, when it says, I will give God what he wants. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus was actually in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he had to go to the cross. And he's there praying to God all night long because he knows what's coming. He knows that they're going to arrest him. He knows he's going to die. He knows they're gonna, he's going to put them on the cross. And he's praying all night long. God, if you can, just take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. This is too hard for me to bear. How many of us in our life have problems in our life that we just say, it's too much for us to bear? I can't do this on my own. I can't fulfill this. I can't accomplish it. And what happens is Jesus sees an angel show up. And God gives him the encouragement to continue on. He fills him. He empowers him because he makes himself available to God through prayer. And he's praying all night long and God shows up. And he fills him up and gives him the courage. And so God goes before Pilate after he's arrested. And Pilate says, is it true that you're the son of God? And Jesus remains silent. And the soldiers took Jesus and Pilate ordered for the soldiers to beat him down because he wouldn't respond. And Jesus stands back up empowered by God to do what God had called him to do. And the soldiers come and they give him a cross and he begins to carry this cross up there. In his strength, he gets the nails put through his hand and through his feet and the cross is there and he's hung. At any time, he could have called the angels and instead he died for his people and humbled himself for those who hated him because number four, he did what God wants him to do regardless of any thought for himself. That's a mature believer. We often can't be there. We can't put ourselves there. But over time, making ourselves available to God, what he does is he shows us and gives us the faith and he encourages us and he moves us along to that mature state. But it's going to take time. And so 
We speak it in truth and we speak it in love. It's the same thing that Jesus did. We mimic after him. For number what? For number five, the fifth M is to give us a ministry. Our job as people is to minister to others, to speak it in truth and speak it in love in order to grow daily to be built up into the body of Christ. Who is the head? Jesus. He's the one we're supposed to mimic. He's the one that makes the decisions for us. He's the one that leads our life. We're not the head of our future. We're not the head of our destiny. We don't make decisions. No, if we know this Bible and what it teaches over time period, we're allowing Jesus to become the head. And what are we? We are the hands and we are the feet. We are to move and we are to work. But Jesus is the one to make the decisions. That's what a mature believer is. One that allows Jesus to continually make decisions over their life. And so people can come to church and sit here on Sunday mornings and that's great and they can worship. But that's not the main call that Jesus gives us. He calls us to learn how to mimic after him. So what do we do? We have weekly Bible studies because that's how we actually break down the truth. My encouragement for all of us here is to get involved in a weekly Bible study because it's on that weekly basis that we can actually hold each other accountable. When you can get into a group of others and actually share your thoughts and your feelings and you can wrestle with this word and you can wrestle with this text and you can learn what it says. You can grow on Sunday mornings, yes, but you won't grow as fast as you can. It's like eating a bunch of fruits and vegetables when you get into these Bible studies. You grow quicker. You're stronger. You're more efficient. If all you do is live for the snack foods, what happens? You're not going to be as healthy. And so God says, I'm a parent giving you good fruits and vegetables, trying to grow you in your faith. Get involved with a small group. Get involved with people around you who can encourage you when things are going tough in your life. And they can actually support you. And you know what? When you go astray, that small group, they're going to go after you and they're going to call you and they're going to say, why aren't you here? You're part of the body. We miss you. It's like adjusting to a body without a hand. If someone's not there, we're missing our hand. We're disabled. We need you there. God wants you there as part of his body because we all have works. And so we can all minister. We can speak the truth in love. We're empowered through these small groups. So we go out to our workplace and then we encourage others because we've been filled up with God. It's the same thing Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He spent time with God in prayer. Then he went out and he poured and he invested in his disciples. Then his disciples went out and he, they poured and invested in others. It's the same thing we do. We show up on Sundays. We get poured into by God. Then we go throughout the week and we pour into others all around us. We speak it in truth and we speak it in love. We're to do ministry. But we can't do that unless we're learning how to mimic. And we can't do that unless we learn the truth. So we can't be measured of our growth and continue to grow unless we actually start to mentor others, unless we begin to mimic Jesus, unless we begin to mature in our faith and we begin to do ministry. It's a process is what Paul's teaching us in this passage, that you guys are going to grow up into maturity and to be able to minister, but you got to get to a mentor and we mentor people in those groups. You got to be able to mimic Jesus. You got to mature in your faith in what this Bible says in knowledge because if you don't know what this Bible says, you're going to live life however you want. You're going to live life for you. You're going to become the head. And what this says is make Jesus the head because God cares about you. He loves you and he wants the best thing for you. What happened after Jesus died? You say, it didn't sound like God wanted the best thing for Jesus. He allowed him to die. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. See, we end the story at Jesus' death, but the story doesn't end there. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God and he is to be glorified. And it's the same thing that God wants to do for us. When we die, it's not the end. Jesus raises to us back to life if we have faith in him. So he's nurturing us for a purpose, to do ministry in our lives here on this earth. But it's not going to end there. We're going to continue to do, glorify him in heaven when we become complete, completely mimicking Jesus. It doesn't end at death. It's only a beginning. And so we're learning on a daily basis to be obedient to him. 
to make a make after him to grow and we have many processes in place for that get involved in a group get involved with a mentor have coffees with somebody and spend time learning to be obedient to Jesus and growing in your faith so you can look back and say man I've grown in the last year man I've grown in the last five years man I've grown in the last ten years but if you don't do anything you won't grow at all you'll stay plateaued and you'll stay the same bow your heads with me in prayer Father we come before you today and some of us I know have plateaued Lord I, I know there's times in my own faith that I have plateaued and Father I'm called to lead your people and Father I confess right now our sins of where we've tried to do life on our own and, and we only look to you for the blessing we don't look to continually grow and to maturity to allow you to be our head to allow you to dictate our decisions to allow you to control our actions and our feelings and and become obedient and so father I confess right now that I'm sorry that I've chosen to do life a lot of times without you and father I just ask for forgiveness along with everyone in here but father just like you're a loving dad who encourages us and when we fall off that bike you place us on the bike and you tell us to walk again just like that loving father who picks up a child and says take two more steps take three more steps I'm rooting for you I'm encouraging you I want to see you do it father thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers each one of us to make decisions to live for you father encourage us this morning to get involved in some type of mentorship to get involved in some type of weekly Bible study to get involved with a small group of friends Lord who read your word to learn in knowledge and faith so we don't get tossed back and forth by the waves so we don't give in to culture so we don't try to live life for just ourselves we want to live life for you because we want to be able to look back and see our growth so father through your Holy Spirit bless us this morning to become mature believers Bless our church so we can minister to others and you will build your church up, the body of Christ. Help empower us this morning, Lord, so we can make an impact of those around us. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.